the stage, Charlotte Chung. Hi guys! Annyeong! <laughs> <laughs> lower than this, right? I don't think so. You can just kind of tip it. Oh, okay. Up to you. Whatever's most comfortable. Vertically challenged over here. <laughs> don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. Oh, so how are you doing today? I'm good. Um, I'm super happy to be here. We're happy to have you. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. I don't know if you guys know, but Charlotte was supposed to be a guest for QuaiCon 2020. Yes. This is and true. we all know what happened in 2020. And so we're excited to finally have you here. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, even before 2020, hi. Um, the the whole um, we were working on trying to get me to Kauai Con for probably two years before that. So it was in. Um, hi. I, I see all you familiar faces now. I'm like, oh my gosh, and some that I don't know. Um, but yeah, we were supposed to. We, like I think we started talking about it with you know with the with the owner for like the last like for two years prior to 2020 and then finally we we locked down you know we locked down the deal the contract and we we're like okay let's do it and okay. then but around the time so the shutdown happened what was it like March 16th or yeah, 18th it was or something March. Like, it's crazy that we all remember you know that there was like an actual day of sh shutdown in in at least the United States and. Um, and I think maybe it was like a week prior to or the week after. But anyway, around that same time, I found out I was pregnant. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, and so then as, <laughs> so as we were going through, um, you know, the world kind of like Changing. falling yeah. apart, you know, yeah. at that moment, we're like, what is this thing? It was like, a, it was so apocalyptic, right? Like yeah. in some way, because we had no idea what we were going through. We ended up um, also finding out we're having another baby, so it's like. So ultimately, like I don't know if I would have been able to make it anyway. With whether I don't right. want to blame you know this of pandemic course. for everything, <laughs> but there was like a whole slew of things. But that's and then then because we went through the pandemic for such a long time, I wasn't like I was like high risk because of like the, sure. the infants and stuff that were more vaccinated. So we ended up. Um, I also ended up delaying coming back, and then finally, all the stars aligned, and I'm here now. So I'm very, oh, it's very. So so wonderful to have you here. Thank Welcome you. To Hawaii. Thank you. Are you a native of Hawaii? Um, I am. Well, local. native as in like yeah. you're local. Yep. Yeah. Born and raised here. I can I, You know what? One day, I I really want to be able to say that I'm a local. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> you I'm, were born and raised here. I was. I don't look it. Oh my god. I don't go out. Very oh, much that's very cool. <laughs> do you like being, you know, in Hawaii? I do. It's oh, a lot of fun. Oh so. I, it's funny because I have, you know, some Hawaiian friends in the mainland and they're, they've like, oh, I run away from Hawaii, like, that's where I go to see my family for two weeks, but that's all I can handle, and then I, I, I have to come back. But then everybody in the mainland is always like, um, I want to live in Hawaii, I want to run away from the mainland, and I'm one of those people. So this is my fifth visit to Oahu, and, but my first uh, Kauai Con, and um, I ended up, also I've been to Kauai and I've also been to Maui, so it'll be my seventh visit now to Hawaii. And the, bit, the more times I come, the more I'm like, I really want to live here. So I don't know, maybe I'll have like, you know, I'll do Kauai Con every year. Yeah, <laughs> it's we would always love to have you. I think it's one of those things, like, when you grow up here, it's a very small town. Um, I mean, even though it's like, quote unquote, big city Oahu, considering like, the smaller islands, but you always kind of want to get away, do the bigger thing. Yeah. Whereas I think you know, if you grow up in a big city, it's a little different. Yeah. Well, I grew up in you know somewhat of a big city. I guess LA is, but like suburbs of LA, and I'm like wanting to come to a smaller, you know, smaller, more hometown feeling where everybody knows each other. So it's so funny because so I have family on the island, and um, um, they. Uh, these, these, uh, I guess I could call them kids, but yeah, these seniors in high school came to visit me yesterday at my table, and they, they were so just like, they were just so cute. But anyway, yeah, that's, they were like tall, and they all looked like models, and like, like surfer models or something. And anyway, so I was, I was admiring them, and then they were telling me that they were seniors in high school, or they were in like a juniors or seniors in high school, and then I ended up, um, and I was like. I didn't want to do that thing where it's like, do you know so and so just because I'm in Oahu, in Oahu, like as if everybody knows each other? Oh, but we do, honestly. <laughs> they knew my nephews. I was like, do you know? Okay, so my nephews went to, and I feel like 
That's another thing about Hawaii. I everybody feel like else high everybody, school. no, everybody. I feel very safe here. So when I go to like, um, you know, not to bad on like the mainland so much, but then when I'm there, like I'm, you know, like I would be very careful about people's like privacy, my own privacy and stuff. But then I was like, oh, my nephews go to um, went to one of them went or two of them went to Hawaii Baptist, and so I was like, like, do you know the Ings? And then he was like, oh. Aaron's my friend, and I was like, what? What, what are the chances? So That's crazy. Everybody knows each other. Yeah. yeah. Or you know someone who knows that person. Yeah. Uh, even and like at this convention, like I've been coming here uh, as part of the convention since 2007. So like I see so many like familiar faces. Now I see coworkers, things like that. It's a small island. Yeah. Small state. But I was surprised because I all I did was say the last name, like my nephew's last name, and he knew the first. And I was like, you can't even make that up, you know? So yeah. I was like, I, was, I really, I thought that was so, so cool and such a good, like, good part of Hawaiian culture, the family vibe, you know, that we don't often get in, Cal at least in California, which is where I was born and raised. So, anyway, enough about <laughs> all of that. Um, yeah. I just wanted to kind of get us kicked off before we open it up to the audience. Sure. Um, so it's great that you're here. We're yes. so happy to have you. And you know, if you stay, we won't complain. <laughs> we always love to have you back. Yeah. Oh, aloha. Yeah. Um, so being in voice acting, I guess one thing I wanted to ask is, being a woman in VA, especially an Asian woman in VA, yeah. what was your experience like? Like, especially like. A lot of your colleagues are probably white males. Yes. Yeah. I, I'll just say it. It's true. So um, being in that industry, like, what was it like, kind of breaking into it? Yeah. Um, I. Where do I even start? So uh, I come from the on-camera world. So I was doing, you know, television. Um, like people always ask, oh, what what head shows have you done? So I've been on like Shake It Up a long time ago on Disney Channel, Drink and Josh. That's where I started. So I, I, I was I guest starred on Shake It Up with Zendaya and and Bella Thorne and and I was I did a little bit of a stint on uh, Desperate Housewives, Boston Legal with William Shatner, and so I was working in television um, for about eight years, and then I wanted to eventually get into voice acting because and this is the truth. Like even if you're on television three or four times a year as a guest star. It doesn't make enough to like make, live live comfortably. So I was still like tutoring. I was waiting tables. I was, you know, picking up odd end jobs. And um, I just was like, okay, I want to do something. You know, and I was still doing like I, I did like a Toyota commercial, and um, I think it was a Toyota commercial. It's been so long now. Sure. Buick commercial. Like I've done. You know, no matter how much you're like, oh, I'm just gonna do modeling on the side, or I'm gonna do this on the side. Like, also, that doesn't last forever, right? Like, you, you can't, you know, look like you're 15 forever. So, I was like, okay, I really wanted to get into voiceover, but voiceover, as like, because I, I wanted to continue to be an actor in some capacity. So, even if you are, let's say, doing, I don't know if any of you are interested in acting, but if you wanna become an actor, it's very easy to become, for example, like a career server at a restaurant or something because every I, I had this idea because I was making actually a lot more being a tutor, but then um, per hour um, by much more. But what happened was I felt like every bona fide actor has been a, a, like a, a, a waitress at some point, for lack of a better word, right? I'm like, oh my god, I always want to be able to say like, oh yeah, I used to wait tables and I was horrible at it or something, but I wasn't, I was really good at it. But anyway, because um, you know, like really good actors are always like, oh, I was an actor, but like, I mean, I was a server, but I was like really bad at it. And that's why I had no choice but to continue to try to become famous or something. I'm like, no, I was a really good server. However, um, you could get really stuck doing that, you know? So then I was like, okay, I want to do something where I can continue to be creative and um, make money within the union and voiceover work as well as like commercial work being you know an actor for commercials radio talent all of that is um, within the same sort of umbrella and so um, I try to break in in many different ways but it's such a niche group of people as you guys see like when you Kauai Khan every year you see that sort of like the same kind of people come over and over and they're like oh Wait, so One Punch Man is also 
also Harry Osborn is also, you know, like everybody, you know, the same people kind of get used over and over again, right? And so, and it's kind of like that in the movies too, you know, where you're like seeing like Ben Affleck as Batman is also the guy, the robber guy is also, you know, like it just like everybody, people like to see the same people over and over again or use the same people in production over and over again. So I ended up um, looking for a, a voice agent for years, years, right? But, and the reason why I wanted to go into voiceover was because in high school, I guess I have a certain, like I have a deeper voice now, but it was because, um, and I'm going off on a tangent, but I know exactly where I'm going to come back to. I was on um, my very first break into voice, the voiceover industry, my big break, was Call of Duty Black Ops 3. I play a character named Seraph, and her voice is like, the 54 mortals shall never die! So it's like that, like completely different from D.Va. And, excuse me, <coughs> and so, um, and I, it was my first job, so I ended up wanting to do a really good job, and so most of the time it's actors, um, this is kind of like boring logistics, but there's like four, a four hour cap on actors, uh, on, a, on a voiceover job. But, and I would go all four hours, even though most people quit at two. They always say to their agent, can you let the production know that my cap is at two hours, but I never spoke up because I was like scared and I wanted to do a good job. So I worked on this, uh, on this video game, Call of Duty, for, four, uh, for like a year, maybe more, without complaining, and one day I started bleeding. So I went to the bathroom and I was like, <laughs> and I look and it's like pink. And I was like, oh my God. So I basically ruined my, my vocal cords. Ruin is a strong word, but it forever changed my voice because I my voice used to always be at this vocal level, no matter what. <laughs> and it was funny because when I would go out, so I you know would go out for like Grey's Anatomy, or I would go out for you know like shows about law, you know the law and stuff like that, Law and Order, or whatever. And um, people, whether I'm going out for like the role of a doctor or the role of a of um, of a lawyer or something like that, they would say like, she comes off, like the feedback would be like, she comes off like she's mature mentally, but then she sounds and looks really young. And it's true. So I started in the industry in Hollywood after college and my first break was when I was 23 years old, but I would play 15 years old on Boston Legal. And I played Ming Na's daughter. You guys know who Ming Na is, right? Yes. She, um, uh, she's in uh, Star Wars and um, she's Mulan and stuff like that. And I know she's been to Hawaii like many times, so you guys are familiar with her. But I played her daughter in Boston Legal, and um, but I was like at that point I was like 27 playing 15. It was wild. It was wild. Yeah. So anyway, I um, I we. Uh, da, 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 da. So uh, yeah, I you know the confusion around like because I, I no matter how much I'm saying you know I'm like take me seriously I was like kind of sounding like a little girl and so in some ways it was a blessing in disguise that this changed my voice register a little bit but as does age right like you you know as you get older you also you know your voice matures but. I got Overwatch, at, that was my big break after Call of Duty. I had other roles in between, but they were smaller, you know, just regular sort of jobs. And then I got Overwatch, and um, I was still able to, you know, create and bust out Diva's voice. And so it didn't completely ruin my voice, but that is sort of the ladder of what happened. But from getting to a point of like just only being on television, like with my face and acting, and then being able to break into the voiceover world was a big leap. And it's a too long of a story on how I eventually get represented, but I got an agent and then, um, and then we were off to the races. I actually got my big break because um, outside of Call of Duty, I, one of my first jobs was on the Conan O'Brien show, uh, and for some of you who don't know who Conan is, he was like a talk show host back in the day, um, but I, they were looking for, they were doing a segment on um, North Korean Teletubbies, they got the rights to tel for Teletubby to, like, act, uh, and the son was Kim Jong-un's face, and so they were looking for a Teletubby voice who could speak in North Korean. I do not know how to speak North Korean. No South Korean knows how to speak North Korean. That is a communist country that nobody has really access to. And if you have, you know, you can see some of the news footages and stuff like that on YouTube. So that's exactly what I did. 
they offered me the job. I go on YouTube and I start looking up how to speak in North Korean and I just kind of, I mean, it was probably as bad as if I tried to speak pidgin right now. Like, it was so bad. Like, nobody would believe me, you know what I mean? And I was like, okay, whatever. So I go on there and I'm like, just like, and I'm just like saying, I mean, I'm saying, speaking in Korean, but like making right. all these random intonations and they hired me because, you know, Hollywood doesn't care, and doesn't know, they right? Don't know. They don't know. So <laughs> I go and get that job and then I get another job called Battlefield, which is another video game. I also was playing a North Korean attache in there and then, then I get offered, I start getting offered, I start becoming the North Korean girl. I'm like, oh, hell no, this is not going the direction, you know? I was Mingna's daughter, okay? I don't need to be playing no North Korean forever, right? So I started turning down roles, which is another sort of, you know, I it's think... Hurdle, you know? No, I, what my point is, is that I think, um, you know, for any of you guys that are on, in a crossroads, right, where you're being, you keep going down a path that you don't really want to go down, right, I think it's really important to um, know when to say no so that other opportunities open instead of saying yes out of fear. Always say yes out of love, not yes out of fear. Because if you love what you do, if you love the person who's approaching you, who you know who wants to be your friend or your boyfriend or your gr girlfriend, wife, partner, whatever it is, if you love the opportunity, if you love anything, it will you know go towards the right direction. If you do things out of fear, what if I don't get another job? What if this person is the only person who will ever love me? What if this is the only, you know, these are the only friends I'll ever have? What if, what if, what if, what if? And if it's like, so I'm gonna do it, it usually, or it will lend itself to going in the wrong direction. So I thought, okay, do I wanna just play these incidental North Korean characters forever? <laughs> it's like, no, I don't. I don't love this anymore after two North Korean jobs. I'm going to stop. So as I started rejecting these auditions and opportunities that were being placed on my table, I decided to go a different direction. And sure enough, more direct, more um, opportunities came up. So um, yeah, all this to say, I, I will credit, though, that I did get these opportunities. You know, I started building my voiceover resume from these silly little North Korean characters, the first two, but that then led to really big roles, which then led to, I think it was maybe, so I started in 2006 is when I started my career, and, in, and Overwatch came out in 2015, and then officially in 2016, and I think I started working on it in 2015. So nine years into my acting career, um, I get this audition. Because I know that this is the next question. What, how did you get Diva? How did you get Overwatch? How did you get it? How did you get it? And so I get this audition from my agent, um, who I'm thrilled to be with. And at this point, it was so hard. It was like years and years and years trying to find somebody to like represent me. And in, 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 which is like interesting because like a lot of it's actually like people. Like it's really hard to break into television, which is another fun story that I'll, if I'll that maybe if we have time I'll end with. But um, because as an Asian American woman um, back in 2006, um, it was you know our representation was still very slim. And you, know, you guys, you guys know when you see TV, it's not like you know you see a bunch of like Asian people all the time. And so it was really it was really difficult um, to. To, but I got lucky and I stepped foot in Hollywood and three months later I got my first big role on TV on a show called um, Cold Case and CBS and again I'm gonna, I, I'll share about that later but um, I ended up getting this audition for Overwatch and it just basically said Blizzard Entertainment, her name is Hana Song, they had like a generic, a real human generic character of like a K-pop cutesy girl and a description of her saying she was like, uh, she was like a, a video game um, a phenom and that she's also a K-pop star. I'm like, okay, she, she does both, okay. And then like, <laughs> she, and she's like a phenomenal cook, no kidding. She's like, she does everything, right? So I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and, and, and this is another really good question that people ask, like, why do you think you got it? And I, you know, when you want something big, like, for example, like, I, I've been up for a couple of Marvel things before for, like, on camera, like, action things. Um, one was, like, a TV series, and, um, you, when you want something so bad, like, I'm like, oh my god, of, of course I want to be a part of the Marvel franchise. Like, of, of course, like, I want to be, you know, I want to do something in the action world, right? Like, you end up doing things that you think that the producers want so that they will pick you. 
But really, the secret to every acting job, and almost every acting job, you know, of course you have like insights and stuff like that, but the, the secret to every acting job is really to be your authentic self. Because no matter what, like let's say they say, okay, this girl is like diva, her name, they didn't say her name was diva, but they said her name was Hana Song, which it is, but they, let's say they're like, oh, she's like a K-pop star and she's this and she's that. And, you, and you're thinking about like, okay, well, last time when they cast so-and-so in StarCraft II, it kind of looked like this, so she probably wants this. Then you start going in an inauthentic direction and they don't even feel how real it is. Because really what you want is to be able to feel like the person is real, right? It's a, and relatable. So um, I, I ended up um, doing, so the voice that you guys hear in the game is the exact voice that I did in the audition. And that usually doesn't happen because sometimes you'll like do an audition and then once it's done and you get the role, they're like, okay, so you know, we really liked the voice that you did in the audition, but do you think you can like pitch it up or pitch it down? But they wanted it, wanted her to be exactly what I brought in. And it's because I took the concept that I saw and made her my own. What I wanted Diva to sound like, I made that in my head. I'm like, okay, so she kind of has a little bit of like a Korean accent, um, but she, you know, and but then it's it's understandable. But then and she sounds young, so I want her to sound young, but really powerful at the same time. And I made this character this voice, and they loved it. And then another secret that I have is um, for this one, I dressed like a K-pop star to the audition, and so. <laughs> And I'm like, what was your outfit like? You oh my god, yeah, it was this like, um, there was this like brand called American Apparel back in the day, and it's like these like very like um, simple things, but it was like a metallic purple, like, uh, this was before babies, and so I was able to like fit into a tiny like little size zero like elastic like oh, dress, okay. but it's like a spaghetti strap, like metallic purple oh, like yeah. dress, and then it poofs out. Oh, and okay, it flares out. Story. Yeah, and it, it was like a little, like like a skirt, like something so diva would wear. And then I, I, I think I wore like heels or something, like ridiculous, right? And I, voiceover auditions, you know, people are like, oh, this is why I'm, um, you know, um, you know, people insult people on radio, and it's more like a self-deprecating thing. But they're like, oh yeah, I have the face for radio. So it's like people in entertainment who don't show their face on TV, but they are entertained with their voice or whatever. They go, I have face for, you know, I have the face for radio. Um, and like that's fine. And people are like, oh, it must be so nice that you don't have to. Actors, for example, who don't know what it's like to be in voiceover, they're like, oh, it must be so nice to be able to just roll in your pajamas and like do voiceover. And it's like really not like that, especially for women. Like, I cannot roll, wash my face, brush my teeth, and like roll into the studio not looking like this. You know what I mean? Like, they're going to be like, oh, you know, people are human and they're like, they are attracted to what they want what they're attracted to, so especially as women, like there's still pressure to like try to impress, at least in the audition stage. Now once you get the job, you know, maybe you can like roll in in like a pantsuit or something, or like sweatsuit or something like that. But, you know, um, we do that anyway for on camera too. You know, you actually go on set with a fresh face and clean hair and like, you know, like a jogger outfit or something and then everybody else, somebody else is dressing you, somebody's doing your hair, somebody's doing your makeup. You guys see it on Instagram all the time, people in their trailers and stuff. So we go in and and that was, I think, a little bit of also the, the bias that people have in their head. And so I dress like what I think Diva would look like in this like cute little K-pop like party outfit and did the audition and got a call back. And it was actually between me and a girl I knew a friend that I'm no longer friends with anymore, but not because of Diva. Diva sure. did not break us up. Um, uh, she was a little bit of a toxic person, but anyway, it was between me and her. Nobody's reacting. Nobody's putting this on YouTube, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, she was also signed in. It was like between me, her, and like a, you know the final stage. It goes out to like 2,000 people, and then finally, so it's like winning the lottery in a lot of ways to be able to get a role, you know, in something like Overwatch, and so. I got the call and they were like, I don't know, six months later or something. They're like, okay, Charlotte, uh, we have some big news for you. And I was like, okay, yes. Um, and they're like, oh, you won the role for this, for Overwatch. And at that point, only the beta had come out and like the Tracer trailer. And I was like, oh, um, yay. 
<laughs> what is it? <laughs> and they're like, when did I audition for this? Totally forgot. Totally forgot that I auditioned for it. Totally forgot. Don't even know what it was. And so I end up getting it and um, I start working on it. It's kind of exciting. And the reason it's exciting is not because I think Overwatch is a big deal. And in fact, people were like, oh, this is like Titans, scraps of Titans. So, you know, you're not even gonna, no, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's just like scraps that like nobody cares about. So I'd go into other big like roles, right? Yeah. Even like Call of Duty, I was still working on that. Or I was working, like I've been on like, you know, a Ratchet and Clank or whatever. I've done so many different kinds of video games. I did like little incidental roles on Final Fantasy. Um, uh, and, and not saying that those specific games would do this, but these huge franchises that I would be a part of, they would say to me like, oh, like, oh, you're on that game? Because I'm, oh, what are you working on right now that's like really like, taking up a lot of your time? I'm like, oh, I'm working on this game called Overwatch. And this is again before nobody even see, anybody even sees Diva. And I was like, they were like, oh, that game. <laughs> like scraps. Like it's trash. It's trash. And then it blew up, right? And I was like, so <laughs> oh yeah. Like I was so <laughs> years, right? Like one, two years of hearing this over and over again in other studios and being like, okay, but I'm not even offended because I'm not even taking that much ownership over like Overwatch. I don't even know really what she looks like at this point. I see like a video, like a picture of her, but she hasn't been released to the public yet. And so in hindsight, I'm defensive of, of all those people hating on Overwatch and saying that it was going to do nothing and it was going to go any, nowhere. But that was what was, you guys don't know this, but that was like the rumblings of the people in the industry. They were like really bagging on, on, the, on the game for a really long time before it became what it became. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it was, it was exciting. I, I, have, I, take, I tell another story. By the way, is this like boring you guys? Are you guys, are you guys still with me? <laughs> I know you're like trying to ask questions, but I already like, I know I'm like, I want to share it. There's so much to share. It's by all means as much as you want to talk. And that's what I'm here for, just to help glue things along. Facilitate, yes. Um, thank you. Um, but the thing that was really exciting for me was that, not that it was Overwatch, but it was Blizzard Entertainment. And the reason is because growing up, my guy friends in high school were playing StarCraft and you know, um, they were playing WoW and all this stuff and they never thought to even ask me or the other girls in our group to play. And they would be at, the, we would have these things called PC bum. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's like old school, like, like room, like kind of where they have a bunch of computers that are really like high, yeah. high. You basically performing. like can pay to enter, and you just get to have access to a computer and really high speed internet. Yes, right? exactly. And they don't really have them anymore, but they would go and play um, because our computers at home were not as like high performance as PC bunk computers, and so they would go and stay there all night <laughs> and like not include us. And my best, one of my best friends. Uh, I always say his name now because I don't really care and he's still one of my close friends, but Eric. Eric and I would come home after school and then he would play, be playing Tekken. Do you guys know the story by any chance? Did any, does anyone? You know the story because I told you this yesterday. Okay, everybody else doesn't. So he'd be playing Tekken and he'd be like, oh, so I'll buy you lunch. Can you just um, like spar with me on Tekken? And I'm like, okay, but what do you mean by that? He's like, oh, just press B. And I was like, for like an hour? And he's like, yeah, I'll buy you lunch. Okay, I don't need lunch, okay? But I was like a really nice friend, so I was like, fine. So I would still sit there, pressing down, pressing B, and like, this is the move. <laughs> for an hour, while he is practicing his combos on me, or on my character, not on me. <laughs> that sounds really weird. Um, on my character and children in here? Okay. Um, on my character, and um, I, you know, I didn't think to go, can I just play? Like, why do I have to be sparring with you? And so I always, I told him the story later that I always bag on him in, pan, on him in panels now. And I, you know, because I grew up playing Duck Hunt, I played um, Lion King. It was like the one Sega Genesis game that I beat. It was like so hard when like, I was like trying to get onto that. Anyway, it's like an old, old, old school. I grew up playing Tetris. I grew up playing Zelda. I grew up playing Street Fighter and I was always, like obli obligated to pick Chun Li when I, I always wanted to be uh, Ryu, you know, or like if Ryu's already taken, then Ken, and like, but 
we have these notions in our head about, and I just recently experienced it. My son, who's four, just uh, joined Little League, and so he started playing baseball. And it's like, it's still daddy in me, or like parent in me, and so all the dads are out there on the field, and I'm just sitting there like watching my daughter, me and my, da me and my daughter, like the two girls in the stands, like watching the boys. And the second week of practice, one of the dads couldn't make it, and so the mom went out and was there, and for the first time it dawned on me that like, oh, like Tom, my husband, doesn't always have to be the one to accompany my son on the field. Like, I could go there too. I'm like, I felt so mad at myself for not even having the imagination to think that I can go out there on the baseball field too, because I can totally help my kid play baseball. You know, I have, I'm a, I have some athleticism in me too. And so we as women or as people of color are always challenged to, you know, to imagine ourselves outside of what people expect of us or what society tells us we can do, right? And I imagine that that can also be here on the island, like, oh, this is where you grew up, like, you're not gonna leave here, this is, this is what you're gonna just end up doing. And your parents sometimes might even say, you should just do this, like, this is the easy way to go. Or like, not to like, you know, bag on like Asian people too much, but then it's like, oh, like, um, uh, you know, mommy is a nurse, so you become a nurse too. Or mommy is a hairdresser, so you become a hairdresser too. Or daddy is, you know, this, and so you go into construction. Or you go, you, you know, daddy's an accountant, so don't go for something too big, you know. You, you should just become a teacher. Not that the teacher is bad, but like, there's this like mentality that I think that we are sort of like, go for your dreams is like not a thing, you know, all the time. And sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And to be able to break out of the, those cultural barriers for me is still a struggle, you know, whether it's like a sexism thing or a racism thing or whatever thing, right? So, yeah, I still deal with it. And looking back, you know, at, um, at getting Overwatch and Blizzard, to me, my personal experience was like, oh my god, all those boys who never let me play in high school, I'm in the ending game! And I was and I know, you know, I don't talk to most of those boys anymore, but I know, like, they're like, oh my god, like, <laughs> she's in the game. And so there was, like, sort of an ultimate, like, booyah, sort of, like, um, full circle moment for me of being, like, bullied is a strong word because it's not, I've been bullied before, you know. Just exclusion. Yeah, but being excluded. Um, so I don't want to call it that, but just, like, um, yeah, being excluded and, you know, feeling less than and stuff like that. And just not imagining you as the type to play video games or do things that are outside the box. Yeah, and it's not even imagining me being the type of limiting me for me instead of being like, hey, do you want to play with me? It's like, oh, can you just like, can I just use you? Yeah, press B or press down or whatever. So yeah, that was, and, it, and it's my, it's playful. I'm not like actually feeling like, <laughs> I'm diva. You know, it's not like that. But there's just a little bit of satisfaction there of being like, yeah, and for me, it's the impact that Overwatch and the impact that D.Va and, you know, any of my other characters that I feel very proud of has on the collective society in the world. Like, when I first started playing um, Overwatch, I was on PC and I was a Roadhog main. And I was Roadhog for two weeks. I liked eating and I liked his hook and it was like, oh, like I just like, oh, like nobody, like I went like full hog on like, oh, like, oh yeah, you expect me to be diva. Well, I'm not diva. Oh, you expect me to be mercy. I'm not mercy. I'm a pig. You know, and so I went that direction full force because it's like, that's the thing about video games. You can be whatever the heck you want. You know what I mean? Like if you haven't been out of the, if you're not out of the closet yet, there are gay characters that you could play. If you're, you know, you're tra if, if you're trans, there are trans characters that you, you that these days that are being developed. Like if you are, you know, if you always, been, you know, wanted to be Asian, there are Asian characters. If you want to, you know what I mean? Like you, there's so many, and even like Symmetra uh, being on the spectrum, like that to me is amazing. That 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 storyline happened, and that there's representation in autism. You know, even in our game, like it's a very worldly game. And um, I know, like, you know, there's certain opinions about Overwatch 2 and, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> I'm not like, you know, I'm not, you know, um, completely oblivious to it because I feel, you know, very similarly. And I think the devs are, and Blizzard, they're always trying to, you know, work out the kinks and stuff. But the overall impact that at least Overwatch 1 and, you know, even 2 has had, I think, on people and the community, even through the toxicity, is has been really... Um, 
impactful in my life too. So, and going back to saying, you know, you were saying being a woman and a person of color, and um, to me, the thing that Diva did for me was, um, and I know that some of you, you know, maybe like a, a few of you are not here exactly to hear about Diva, but what she did for me was, um, you know, I've always felt that as, a, as an American, it was a disadvantage, at least like in the mainland, the culture is very like different, I think, and that's probably why I'm always like, I'm gonna move to Hawaii because I just feel more comfortable here, but um, if I'm keeping it real, but, um, the being okay, I'm, I'm you know, I was like joking, I'm vertically challenged. I'm 5'3, okay, I'm 5'2 and 3 quarters, but I just say three, don't tell anybody. But I'm 5'3, right? I'm Asian American, I'm, um, and by the way, for example, for example, I started in the industry with my my government name, which is what a lot of my friends still call me, Chihe. It's Chihe in Japanese, I'm half Japanese, half Korean. My mom's Japanese from Osaka, my dad's Korean from Seoul, and half. Uh, Korean and in Korean it's Chihe, right? So it's pronounced different, but same Chinese characters. And people couldn't tell because most casting directors, you know, couldn't tell that I was like a man or a woman. And so then when I would go to these huge casting calls, they'll be like, "Oh, Chai He, Ch uh, Mr. Chung," like assuming I was a man. I'm like, "I'm Mr. Chung," <laughs> and so it got to a point. And then I would go into and, and I speak. Because my parents were immigrants, and but I was born and raised in America, I could speak Japanese and Korean because my parents wanted me to learn. And so um, being Japanese and Korean, you know, with the history and everything with the two countries, it's tricky. And so they would, even though they were students and they were poor at the time, they would gather a bunch of, you know, all the money they had and send me every other summer to Korea and Japan to spend time with my family in order to learn how to speak Japanese and Korean and know the culture very well. So. That then gets taken into my acting career, and I, that's why like I, I play Kagura, big you know Mobile Legends Bang Bang. I play Korean diva in Overwatch. I play you know even a few Chinese characters, and I play all these characters. And so when when I would go into like an audition that was for on camera, I would speak in English, right? And there's, you know, we all code switch, right? We know, you guys know how to speak like Hawaiian English or Pigeon English, you can all, like sounding English, but if you needed to, you can also really enunciate your words and not sound at all detectable. So I would do these things based on the role. If it's like a role about like, you know, being an attorney or something, then I would make sure that I sound, I don't have any of my Asian accents that sometimes I think my regular like talking voice has an intonation of. Also being in LA, like we kind of like have like a draw like in our place and it's not that bad but like you know when somebody is from LA because like we'll be like oh my god this water is like everything you know it's like it's very obvious right so you have to take all those accents out of your head and to sound very like you're like an operator on the phone and then they'll be like oh my gosh so then I changed my name, which my manager was like, oh my god, if Oprah Winfrey doesn't have to change her name, you don't have to either. That was her actual, her, she's black, so that's why she went and gave me the Oprah, uh, the thing, you know, Oprah example. But she's like, if Oprah doesn't have to do it, you don't have to do it. I'm like, I'm not Oprah, and I am Asian, and so there's so many other cultural things that come with being looking different, you know. So I decided to like pick Charlotte as a name. That's a whole other boring story, but I, so Charlotte ends up becoming my stage name very early on in my career, like 18 years ago. And and I go in and I'm like, oh my gosh, Charlotte, you speak English so good. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, um, thank you. <laughs> it's speak English well, but okay. Um, nobody is saying, I, I was like, I, oh yeah, I was, I was born here. They're like, but how do you speak English so, so good? And I'm like, because I'm American. And they're like, but you speak Korean and Japanese too. I'm like, Yes, I do, I'm trilingual. And it just wouldn't register because of my name, Chie. They're like, they, don't, they couldn't understand why like, I wasn't named Amanda, you know? <laughs> like, they just wanted to really have, they have it in their head that like, if you have an ethnic name, you must not, you must be a foreigner. 
So it was a, it was, now I regret it because I wish you guys and everybody would just call me who I am, but at the same time, I've got, I've, I've made some really close friends now who call me Charlotte, and if they called me Chia, I would be so weirded out. I tried it with one of my actor friends, like, she is also an actress and um, really well known and stuff too, and she was calling me Charlotte for years, and she's like, you know, we're really close now, and I noticed everybody who's really close to you calls you Chia, can I just call you, do you want me to call you Chia or Charlotte? And I'm like, just call me Chia, yeah, let's try that. And then every time she calls me Chia, even through text, it's like, hi Chia, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cringe, like, <laughs> weird, wow, cringe. And so um, and now I've really, I think, uh, and also I think I've probably signed close to a million autographs at this point in, in over the you know course of being diva. Like I've gone to Bahrain and Kuwait and Glasgow, Scotland and Manchester and, and the UK. And I've signed so many autographs as Charlotte. Like imagine all the pissed off Overwatch people in the world are gonna be like, you're now cheer, I have this autograph that says Charlotte. You can't do this to me. Now it's all not, you know, of like legit. No, that wouldn't happen because it's still me, but like now I'm like, oh, you know, we're living in a time now that you have, you know, Daniel o o o Oyelowo or, you know, you have people like, you know, people always say, if you can pronounce Timothy Chalamet, then you can, you can pronounce Chia, like it's not that difficult, but um, it wasn't those times at the time, so now I'm permanently Charlotte for now. That said, going back to being, you know, whatever, I'm five, two and three quarters, three, five, three, five, three, five, three. If you believe it, you can be it. Just kidding. I'm um, five three, right? I'm Asian American. I'm a female. I'm, you know, I'm. Uh, I sound young. I look young. You know, people still think I'm like a student sometimes. I'm like, no, I'm a mommy of like two children, and um, you know, being yeah, so small. I sound young. I look young. Asian American, um, and like you know, all these things, right? Woman that I would always think, feel, that was a disadvantage because it was made to be, like, I'm in a society, I live in a society where all those things like being a tall white male is basically the pinnacle of life and I'm the opposite, in many ways, the opposite of that. But what Diva did for me, much like my living vicariously through Roadhog, right, is um, allow me to see sort of the strength and the goodness in all her characteristics that are very similar to mine. And so, and then seeing, this is the kicker, okay? I would be in Texas, okay? See, meeting somebody in Dallas, Texas, and like there will be a, a six foot white man dressed as Diva being like, hi, I'm Diva. And I'm like, oh my God, that is so ironic, right? Because this is the exact, person that the world puts on a pedestal and puts you know me on a different platform for and yet we have now switched places and those kinds of things would be very empowering to me because he doesn't see me as the way I was seeing myself because of the way maybe I was treated by others. And so it became this global sort of experience for me where I wasn't seeing it only just in one way anymore and I was starting to see parts of me that are similar to Diva as a positive thing. So it really impacted me. And so a lot of people, a lot of you guys come up to me and go, oh my God, like, you know, Diva or Overwatch has impacted me in so many ways and in a positive way. And because she's so strong or she's so cute, but she can also be strong and she can kick ass and she can do this, she can do that. And I, I along with you guys, have the same ex exact experience. The number one question that I get asked Besides, like, what's your favorite skin? What's your favorite line? Is do you play? And so I'll answer that question for you guys. I did. I used to play a lot of Overwatch One because it was before I had children and I had time to put in hours and become a platinum player. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you my rank. But anyway, I had a lot of time to play. You know, so I would play a lot and I would come to these panels and all over the world and people would ask me for like, you know, techniques and oh, what do you do when you're bottlenecked here and what do you do with it? And I'm like, oh my God, if I don't know, if I don't know, this would be the ultimate disappointment as, you know, diva, right? Of all the characters in the game. So I was playing a lot in of Overwatch 1. My husband became a Moira and a Junkrat main and I was like, you should also be playing diva! <laughs> um, that should automatically be his name. 
Yes, exactly. No, but he, he wasn't, and I'm fine with that, <laughs> kind of. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so we would play, and then Overwatch 2, I haven't had as much of an opportunity to play, and because, like, I'm just always really busy either working or, you know, like, trying to survive these two, three, and four-year-old human beings, um, who are, like, you know, who I love them so much, but they drive me nuts. Anyway, um, so, yeah, um, I think that sort of covers your one question that was... Asked, oh my god, it actually 50 covers, minutes ago. No, but actually, uh, no, you, you actually answered a lot of the sub questions I was going to ask and go into. So, okay. you actually like followed that line really well, which I'm sure I'm you've probably pro. been asked <laughs> all of these questions so many times. So, I guess, we got 10 minutes though, so yeah. should we go into questions? Or do um, you have a question? I actually, I guess before um, we can maybe take a couple from the audience, but I wanted to ask, yes. um, besides Diva or I know you must get so many different questions, but is there anything that you would like to share that people don't ask you about or anything that you haven't oh. already been able to put out in the universe? Yeah, well, I'm going to be in a new video game. Um, it's called Toxic Commando. So you guys know the video game Halo. Um, and it's by, um, uh, oh my god, it starts with an S. Um, something, oh my god, and then something entertainment, why am I blanking? Of course, I'm blanking right now, but does anybody know who the... Um, makers of Halo. What? Oh my god, there's people over there. Hi guys! Hi <laughs> <laughs> staff. Hi staff. Oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Anyway. It's, it's by John Carpenter who made Halloween, the movie, and he created this new video game. It's a zombie video game called Toxic Commando. I'm still working on it, and so, but it was announced. Maybe somebody is, um, oh, I thought somebody, I thought somebody was texting me in or something. Um, um, yeah, no, I, and, and it, that's going to be released um, in the next year or two, and I'm one of four main characters, and, um, uh, yeah, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be a really fun, fun game. Um, lots of blood, guts, and glory. So I love it. It's fun. I, my, one of my favorite video games is, um, uh, Black Ops, uh, no, Call of Duty Zombie. Oh, yes, 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 yes. 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 That, <laughs> that map, not the, um, Nixon Library one. Um, does anybody else remember that? The Zombies one? And I would, I have my, it's been a minute, yeah. But the whole thing with that is I was, um, I was like newly married at the time and everybody was like trying to get it for Christmas. It was a release for Christmas and somehow I got my hands on it and I wrapped it and I put it under the Christmas tree for my husband and I'm like, oh my god, I'm like the best wife. And then I went under the Christmas tree, he opens it on Christmas and I was like, oh, like, you know, for Christmas, like, you can open it and play it for however you want. And then Christmas, so it's like the 26th. 3 a.m. and then he's like, um, I'm falling asleep. Like, do you? I think we should just go to sleep. We could play this tomorrow. I'm like, no, you need to stay on it right now. We need to get the Wahoo gun and we need to get to level this and we need to blah blah. And we stayed up until six or seven in the morning on the 26th after Christmas playing zombies because I became addicted to it. So then, like any time, and then so it, the, I got it for myself basically. And I would have my own, um, like I would have my own names for guns because I couldn't memorize them. So I'll be like, you, "Did you did you get the zippy? You need to get the zippy. And after that, you get the alien one. After that, you, get, you need to get. Did you get the wahoo? Get the wahoo! Oh, mystery box, mystery box, wahoo, wahoo! And like I would just have my, you know, the ray gun, the one that goes boom, boom. So I would, I would, that, that was one of my favorite ones. It's your favorite life. What was that? True gamer life. Staying yes. up till six, seven six. a.m. trying to finish a uh, or something. Yes, yeah. and um, and just not being able to get off. Totally. So I yeah. Anyway, that was my favorite one of my favorite games. Um, can we get maybe um two or three questions from the audience? Um, go ahead, raise your hand. We do have a mic. Or yeah, come up to the or, mic. Yeah, if you guys want to come up to the mic, we have just enough time for a few questions. So be thoughtful about what you ask. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask this to a pro. So I didn't realize that there was a four hour limit to the voice thing. I didn't realize it was equal to two. So my question to you is, if you were doing honey, cough drops, tea, all that stuff, would you still have had that reaction? Oh like, yeah, they provide all of that. So even then, you At still- At the studio, would... yeah. And, and there's actually one, um, a Chinese cough syrup called Ninjong, that, um, or Ninjong, that um, all voice actors know about. And it's not like, yeah, there's like a, 
uh, there is a union limit of four hours. You can't work past four hours on any given sort of voiceover job that is under SAG-AFTRA, which is our union. But most people, when it comes to video games that are vocally stressful, usually cap it at two. And, um, but we are stocked with, you know, cough drops and um, ninjam, and I'm chugging all of that all day long, and it was still, it was still yeah, because like nobody goes to four hours, but I was going to four hours, doubling the time that most burly men yeah. exceed, uh, can't exceed, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. When your kids are old enough, are you going to let them play Overwatch? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I hope it's around by the time they're old enough. It will be. They're three and four years old. So yeah, I think I'll let them start playing at like eight, nine, or ten. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, video games are so bad. But also, you know, it's done wonders for the autism community. It's done wonders for um, just, you know, people who um, with brain, brain development and stuff, as long as it doesn't turn into an addiction, I'm all for exposing my kids to video games. I think it's worse when you're like, I don't, I don't, you know, I think it's worse when you're trying to like stop your kids from doing something, you know, that isn't, you know, as long as it doesn't become like a habit, I'm all for it. So, yeah, I don't mind introducing them to video games eventually and, of course, Overwatch. They don't care. Oh my gosh. Some of you guys might have been there to see this, but like my kids came yesterday for the first time because I always travel by myself. My kid, my, my younger kid was like an infant, so he would go around to seven conventions with me at the time. So he was like inside a carrier. Like he was like, oh, you know, like very, very little. He doesn't know. So now they're three and four years old. I'm like, oh my god, they're gonna think I'm so cool. They watch me on TV, actual face. I'm on Carmen San Diego, I'm on Fast and the Furious, but I'm also on like regular TV. I'm like, that's mommy! What do you what do you think? And they're like, I okay. wanna watch SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought they would I'm like, okay, this is real life, you know, they're gonna see me and they're gonna see all the autographs, it's gonna be so exciting. And they came in and they wanted to leave. They'd be like, Oh, okay, beach. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, and I think that that's what keeps me humble. You know, my kids, they just don't give a beep about what I do. <laughs> I'm just mommy. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of the standard. Yeah. Well, we are. Oh, we have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Is it okay if I your reaction? It's just a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, was, was there any um, like moves or anything with Diva that you had any input in that they like was it that you have some kind of uh, control over or if you wanted to do anything? Uh, with that? At this point, I don't remember, but I do like. Um, there, do you remember Gangnam Style, I, the song? So they had the line, oh, 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 diva style. But it was like licensing issues, so they couldn't like, <laughs> so I don't know if you're allowed to post it. Oh, it's okay, just go ahead. You know, we're in Hawaii, so you know, everything, you know, is, is chill, right? Do it, and then I get sued, I don't know. Uh, just kidding. Uh, no, I'm totally kidding. I think you have like a certain time limit in which if you don't do it past a certain point, oh, it's okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, I, no, not really. I, I suppose I could if I wanted to, but I pretty much stick to the script. And um, I, besides, besides creating the voice for them and her accent and her pitch and stuff like that, um, you know, I, no, I just leave all the writing up to the writers. And so, um, no, I, <laughs> that's a boring answer, but no, I just, I just stick to the script. script. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for well, coming out. Oh my God. I, I hope I didn't, you know, bore you on my little soapbox, but you know, um, come out and hear me say it's a skill issue. And I love you guys. Nervous.